So, what are the possible sources of this energy? We know of two possibilities, the initial heat of formation and radioactive decay. It is unlikely that the initial heat of formation could cause the Earth to grow since the source of that energy is actually the potential energy decrease when the Earth shrank when it was first formed because it coalesced out of a whole bunch of uh, comets and dust and debris and gas which collapsed gravitationally in towards their center of mass and heating up as they did so because all they were all falling towards the center and all that potential energy was turned into heat. Now, in order for that same potential energy to be, for that same heat that comes from that potential energy to then be turned around and turned back into expansion, you'd have to postulate some type of spring inside the Earth that would store that energy from shrinkage and then reverse the process and put it back towards growth. Now, you haven't postulated any such mechanism, and geologists haven't found any evidence that such a mechanism exists. This leaves radioactive decay. The big players, in terms of radioactive elements responsible for heating the Earth, are uranium and thorium. Of the isotopes of these elements, which are stable on geologic timescales, thorium-232 emits the least energy, U-238 emits a medium amount of energy, and U-235, that's the good stuff, the enriched uranium, the stuff Ahmadinejad is trying to get his hands on, emits the most energy. Now, for the rest of this video, I'm going to calculate how much U-235 would be needed by your theory, Mr. Adams. But remember that naturally occurring uranium is only about 0.3% U-235, so in reality, you would need much more. So, how much U-235 would be required? Well, uranium-235 contains 2 times 10 to the 13th joules of energy per kilogram of material. This means that even with a perfectly efficient growth mechanism, your theory still requires that there be 8.15 times 10 to the 18th kilograms of U-235 inside the Earth. That's roughly 1.4 parts per million by mass of the entire planet. So, how much uranium does the Earth actually contain? Well, the crust, the part we live on, has between 2 and 4 parts per million, depending on who's done the measurements, what samples they took, and a whole bunch of what the standard of errors are, and some other technical stuff. Now, that's so far so good, right? If we neglect the fact that natural uranium is 99.3% U-238 and not pure U-235, then it looks like your theory is doing pretty well. But that's only the crust. What happens when we look at the whole Earth? Now, in the rest of the Earth, we have the mantle and the core, both inner and outer. Now, the mantle is composed mostly of ultramafic rocks. We know this because the uh, lava which erupts at hot spots is derived from the mantle. Now, ultramafic rocks are dominated by silicate and iron, which often combine to form the mineral olivine. Now, uranium is incompatible with olivine. This means it gets rejected from the crystal lattice. It preferentially melts away and travels with this melt to the surface of the Earth, which is why the crust is enriched in it. As a result, the concentration of uranium in ultramafic rocks is measured in parts per billion, not parts per million. Again, the exact number varies, 
these types of things are hard to measure on a global scale, but all of the values are somewhere between 5 and 20 parts per billion. Even if we give you the benefit of the doubt and go to the top of that range, that's still a hundred times less total uranium than you need of just U-235. So what about the core? Now, obviously, we can't directly sample the core, but from uh, density and from seismic wave propagation, we know that it is mostly composed of iron and nickel. And that is a composition which is very similar to a class of meteorites called chondrites, specifically iron-rich chondrites. And we can sample those. And we have, and we've found, that they have a uranium concentration that is between one hundredth and one ten, ten thousandth of the uranium concentration in the crust. Mr. Adams, you fail. There just isn't enough energy to make the Earth grow. Furthermore, as I mentioned at the beginning, the conservation of energy is only one flaw in your theory, Mr. Adams. You also flatly contradict a, an incredible amount of seismological evidence for subduction, the, as well as the known sea level history of the Phanerozoic, and a dozen other well-established geologic facts. Mr. Adams, you are a cartoonist. Not a scientist. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't come up with good ideas, but it does mean that you probably haven't done your homework. Now, Mr. Adams, you can't propose any scientific theory, let alone one as groundbreaking as this, unless you have done your homework. Paradigms, like plate tectonics, do get overthrown from time to time, but they do not get overthrown by random people who have not done their homework they get overthrown by dedicated scientists who have spent years of their lives doing the necessary background research and laborious study necessary to convince other scientists. You, sir, have done none of that work, and that is why real scientists don't take you seriously. Mr. Adams, Several months ago, I posted a very short version of this objection in the comments section of your video. You replied by saying, The greatest force on Earth would, by necessity, be growth outward against gravity. Pretty cool, huh? <sighs> Mr. Adams, reality is not a comic book. You can't just dream up an absurdly powerful new force requiring absurdly large quantities of energy as though you had just invented an awesome new superhero. And science has to deal with reality. And in reality, there is no free lunch.